Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to MAV 115. Um, so I hope you guys all had a good long weekend, uh, extra day off. That was nice. Um, today, what we're going to do is I'm going to really quickly talk a little bit about Blackboard, uh, and then I'm going to get into the lecture, which is going to just continue what we did last time, and I'm going to fully commit to being at one day behind on the schedule for the time being, uh, just because doing the syllabus on the first day took a little bit longer than uh, I had planned. By the way, if you hear an irritating buzzing in the background of my microphone, that's because my neighbor is drilling something or other, so sorry about that. <laughs> But OK, I'm going to share my screen here, I think, on the laptop really quickly, just so I can show you guys around. The blackboard, so can everyone see my screen right now? Yes, OK, fantastic. Um, OK, so. Let's open the Blackboard. <clears throat> so your Blackboard will look something like this. You'll have uh, different courses than I will, but you'll click on our class Precalculus Mathematics. And there's a few things that I want to make known to you guys. First of all, course content is where mo most of the content is. OK, so course content is where you'll find pretty much everything. Here's where you can click on the anonymous feedback. Uh, survey. OK, so if there's anything that I'm doing during teaching that you're not thrilled about or if there's something that you think I could be doing that you would be thrilled about, uh, please click on this and you can you can. Uh, you can just go to this forms here and uh, it, it's just I'll see what you write and I won't see anything about like your information or your email. Uh, in this important links tab, we've got YouTube channel, Math Tutoring Center, Student Success Center, Self Service, Counseling and Psychiatry. Um, so that's that. And this is where this is the folder that I really wanted to make you guys aware of. It's the exit slip folder. OK, so after every uh, exit slip or after every lecture, there is an exit slip for uh, you guys to complete. The exit slips are worth 7% of your grade and you need to complete these within one week of each lecture. OK, so this was this is the exit slip corresponding to our very first lecture, our second lecture, Wednesday's lecture last week, Thursday's lecture last week and so on and so forth. And if you want to complete one, you just click on it and you can just take these questions here and you can answer them here or you can write a text submission or whatever. So that's how you complete the exit slips. Um, I've extended the due date of the day one, day two, Wednesday and Thursday exit slips from last week to the end of this week. Um, so you can complete all of those. I think the easiest way to do it is just to go on the blackboard right after class and complete the exit slip. Um, I also, any of the questions that come in on the exit slips, I will post weekly to this answers thing here so you can open up this document and it has all the answers to the student questions from the exit slips from last week. Uh, it's useful to go through that because that will contain. Lots of like common questions from students on things. Um, so for example, I don't know what this one's got on it. It's got stuff on it like. Open, please. Like what's what's the best way to practice what we've been learning and things like this. So um, that, that's what you can see on on those. Uh, anything else about the blackboard? Oh yeah, I'll post the course notes to the course notes tab. So this is all of our notes from last week. A student asked a question about um, having the skeleton notes posted to um, Blackboard before um, lecture. <clears throat> so I can try to do that, but I, I need to get a little bit organized, more organized before I can start doing that. But I, I do plan on implementing that. Okay, 
So that's all I had to say about that. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so we're going to pick up where we left off. Uh, let me go back actually to the to the lecture one and remind you where we were the last time. We were talking about um, square roots. Specifically, we were talking about powers of of rational exponents. Okay, rational exponents. Uh, and we we found out that if we take some some number to the power one over a, that's the same as taking the eighth root. Okay, we call it the eighth root or the nth root. Sometimes we'll use the letter n. And uh, for our square root values, um, we, we had these rules uh, regarding square roots. And uh, we're going to expand that a little bit by talking about just general radicals. OK, so not necessarily square roots, but actually nth roots. OK, so we're going to have six properties here. The first property is fairly self-explanatory. If we take the nth root of something and we take it to the nth power, so this is an a inside here, nth root of a, and we take that to the nth power, what are we going to get? Somebody help me finish the rule. That's right, Catherine. We should get just a back. OK. Here's a short proof. If we have the nth root of a, we can rewrite that as a to the 1 over nth power. And if we take that to the nth power, what we would do with these exponents is we would multiply them. We would get a to the power n over n. If we take some number and divide it by itself, we would get just 1. And anything to the first power is just itself. OK, so that's a really fast proof. I'm going to delete that now. OK, second property. We have the nth root of a to the power n is going to be equal to the absolute value of a if n is even and just a if n is odd. OK, so for example, um, if we take the fourth root of a to the fourth power, we're going to get absolute value of a. If we take the third root of a to the third power, we're going to get a. So if a is a negative number, the first one is going to give us the positive version of that number, and the second one here, the cube root, will just give us back the negative number. OK, third property we've got. This is an important one. The nth root of two numbers being multiplied together. Nth root of a times b is going to be equal to the nth root of a times the nth root of b. OK, so this is kind of like the distribution of the power. OK, it's the distributive property of that power, right? If we said if we had x, y, z, and we took the whole thing to the fourth power, we would distribute that fourth power. As long as these are being multiplied, we would distribute that power and we'd get x to the fourth times y to the fourth times z to the fourth. So a similar thing is happening here with our square root. We've got, we've got a times b being taken to the one over nth power, and we're going to distribute that one over nth power onto each of these. We'd get a to the one over nth power, and we'd multiply that by b to the one over nth power. OK, so all of these radical rules are really just coming from uh, 
those exponent rules that we learned a couple classes ago. We're just uh, kind of rewriting them with these radical signs. Okay. So I'll give myself a dividing line here. And we'll talk about four, five, and six. <clears throat> Fourth property we have nth root of a. Uh, actually, I should have drawn that bigger. nth root of a divided by b. Same deal as before, it's going to be equal to the nth root of a divided by the nth root of b. Okay. Fifth property, we will have that the nth root of a to the power m is the same as, now if we were to do this, if we were to perform these operations, so say I gave you a value for a, m, and n, and you wanted to actually evaluate what this number is, according to PEMDAS, what we would do first is we would take a, and we would take it to the mth power first, and then we would take whatever re the resulting number is and take the nth root of it second. Okay, that's what PEMDAS would say, because we can think of there being kind of like parentheses under this radicand. Okay, so PEMDAS would say do the mth power first and then take the nth root. Well, rule number five says we can reverse that. Okay, we can instead do um, nth root of a, and we can take that to the mth power. Okay, so we can uh, we can do powers, exponents, and radicals. Exponents and square roots are the same step on PEMDAS. Okay, they all fall under the E category of PEMDAS. Final rule, if we have the mth root of the nth root of A, then this is going to be equal to the m times nth root of A. And I'll give you a really fast proof of that. Well, mth root is just 1 over mth power, so we take a to the 1 over n to the power 1 over m. We know if we have a number to a power and we take that whole thing to another power, we should multiply those powers. So we would just get a to the power 1 over m times 1 over n, which would be a to the power 1 over m times n, which would be equal to the m times nth root of a. Okay, so these are the properties of radicals. Um, <clears throat> I think most of them are self-explanatory. The really important one is this number three here because that's going to be how we simplify radicals. So four is pretty important too. Three and four are probably the, the most important rules if I was going to pick two. Okay, any questions about the properties of radicals? No questions from Catherine, that's good. Okay, if you do have any, don't hesitate to interrupt. You can speak up on the mic or type out in the chat. Okay, so next we're going to talk about simplifying radicals. And simplifying radicals is a process that we're going to mainly do by using uh, number three here, okay, rule number three. So if we have some square root of some, some number or some nth root of some number, what we can do is we can pull out, so if we have an nth root of, of anything, if we have inside here a bunch of things being multiplied, say we have a to the power n, 
times b. We can rewrite this as the nth root of a to the power n times the nth root of b, and that would be equal to just a times the nth root of b by property number, I don't know, one? No, not one. Yeah, it's one and five together are kind of giving us this, this line of reasoning. Can I explain rule number five again? Yes, I sure can. Okay, let's go back up to rule number five and spend a little bit more time on this. Okay, so rule number five is telling us what? It's telling us that if we take some number a to the power m and we then take the nth root of it, it's the same as if we were to take a and do the nth root of a and then take it to the mth power. Okay, so it's a, it's a statement about the order of operations here. Okay, and <clears throat> I'll explain it. I'll, I'll show you the quick proof. I omitted it for time purposes, but we can do it. So if we take a to the mth power and we take the nth root of it, that's the same as doing the Excuse me, Professor. You are mute. Okay, I'm back now, right? I don't know why I randomly got muted. Okay. All right, uh, so where was I? I was just referring to this uh, proof of this. Rule number five here, I was saying if we take a to the m to the one over n power, we would multiply those powers. And now I can do something a little bit clever and rearrange this in a new way. I can I can sort of unexpand it in, in the other direction. I can write a to the one over n power to the power m. Okay, so in this case, we're doing the m power on the inside and the one over n on the outside. On the right hand side, we're doing the 1 over n power on the inside and the m power on the outside. Okay, so when we do those in those different operation orders, um, it kind of shows us that this, this one on the left is exactly what's going on on the left hand side of rule number five. And the one on the right is exactly what's happening on the right hand side of number five. So that's the proof of uh, of how rule number five works. It just means that we can do nth roots and powers in any order that we like. Okay, so that's the further explanation of five. If you want to hear more about that, um, then I suggest that you come to office hours tomorrow. They'll be from 9.30 to 11.30. Okay, so going back to simplifying radicals, uh, what, what we're doing here is just trying to explain the process of, of how we pull things out of a radical sign. So most students, I think, have probably seen this, at least with square roots, um, but uh, you may not have seen it with nth roots. But basically, if we have an nth root and we have any power of n being multiplied by something underneath the nth root, we can pull it out front but we need to remember to take away the nth power, okay? So a really quick example might be something like, I don't know, the square root of nine times two is equal to three times the square root of two, okay? So inside, I have a square power. I had three squared, and I was taking the square root of it, so I just took it out as three. OK, so that's an example of how we would do that. Um, typically, the way that you'll be given the problem will be something more like you'll be given the square root of 18 and you'll be expected to then 
find the factors of 18 and figure out which ones are um, perfect squares. Okay, so you can either break it down like this, or you can even go so far as to break it down into its prime factorization. And you'd write something like three times three times two, and you'd say, okay, anywhere that I see two of a single number, I'm going to get rid of it on the inside and put it on the outside. Okay, sometimes that's how it's explained. Okay, so let's see some examples. Let's try. Let's try these. We'll try the square root 120 first. Well, we can rewrite this as, I don't know, 12 and 10 maybe. 12 times 10. And uh, I can rewrite that as 3 times 4 times 2 times 5. You write that as 3 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 5. And I can remove any grouping of two numbers which are the same. I'm going to take these two twos here. I'm going to get rid of them on the inside and put them out front. So I will get 2 times the square root, and whatever's left on the inside is just 3 times 2 times 5. I think that's 30. Okay, and the reason that this can't be simplified further is that this square root 30 here, okay, does not contain any square factors. Okay. 30 is just, its prime factorization is, let me use a different color. The, well, that's basically the same color, use green. The prime factorization of 30 is just 3 times 2 times 5. Okay, and none of those are perfect squares, so it can't be simplified further. Okay. All right, uh, are there any questions about how we simplified this first one? This is a square root, so it should be more or less review. Um, so any questions about that before we move on to the cube root problem? Okay, seems like no questions. So let's do the second one here. Okay, we've got a cube root this time. So now what we want to do is we'll find the prime factorization of 135. And we'll be able to pull things out if we have three of a particular uh, number in the prime factorization. Okay. So first of all, I think we can factor, we can divide out of, I don't know, we can divide out of five be 5 and 27. And if you're really clever, you already recognize that 27 is a perfect cube and you can just pull out a 3. But you could take it a little bit further. 27 is going to be 3 times 9. 9 is going to be 3 times 3. And so our prime factorization here is 5 times 3 times 3 times 3. So I recognize that I have a group of 3 of the same number. That corresponds with, so I have 3 of these. That corresponds with the fact that I'm doing a third root. So I can pull a 3 out, and I will then have left over just a square root 5. OK, so that's how I would do that one. So you can always do this process of finding the entire prime factorization. Um, or I think a lot of students would probably go ahead and just stop at this stage here where we have 5 and 27. And they just go straight from that to say, OK, I pull the cube root of 27 out front and then I leave the 5 inside. 
Ah, oh, thanks. Yeah, it should be a cube root over the five. Thank you, Savannah. Yeah, I make notational mistakes like that all the time, so please let me know if I make one. It should be three times the cube root of five. Great. OK, any questions about the cube root example? OK, then we will move on and talk about rationalizing the denominator. OK, so. For whatever reason, the math gods who came before us decided that it is somehow improper to express a fraction with a square root in the denominator. OK, and so in order to avoid this. Egregious offense, we learn this process of, of what we call rationalizing the denominator. OK, so let's talk about what rationalizing means. Well, if we have something like. I don't know. Um, one over the square root of two. The square root of two is an irrational number. There's like a million proofs for it, um, but I think they're sort of beyond the scope of this class. So we'll just take that at face value for now, that two is an irrational number. In other words, it can't be expressed as A divided by B where A and B are integers. OK, it's some crazy decimal that goes on and on forever and never repeats. OK, that's what square root of two is. So to rationalize the denominator. We're going to multiply. By one. In a clever way. We're going to take one over the square root of two and we're going to say that's equal to one over square root of two times one, but I'm going to write one as the square root of two divided by the square root of two. Okay, I'm going to write one as the square root of two divided by the square root of two. If I take a number and I multiply it by one, I haven't changed it. Okay, so this right here is just one. And when I multiply that out, I'll multiply straight across. I'll have one times the square root of two will be the square root of two. And in the denominator, I will have the square root of two squared. And if I take the square root of something and I square it, I just get back that original number. So this is the same as the square root of two divided by two. OK, so that's how we multiply by one in a clever way to quote rationalize the denominator, because now the denominator is two and two is a rational number. In fact, it's even a whole number is a natural number. OK, so two is. Now rational. So that's how we rationalize the denominator. Um, any questions about that? Okay, we'll do this example real quick. We'll do these two examples. Well, square root five over square root two, that's basically the one we just did. We're gonna use one of our rules to split up the square root. And then we're gonna multiply by one. In the top, we'll have square root five times the square root of two. And on the bottom, we'll have the square root of two squared. The top is going to simplify to the square root of 10. Because we had a rule that said that uh, if we were to have two things multiplied under the square root, such as 10, we can send it into this direction. 
we can also go the other way. Okay, we can switch those around. And on the dot bottom, we're just going to have two. Okay, so there's another example of rationalizing the denominator on an easy one. Here's a harder one. Okay, we've got the cube root of 2x to the fourth power divided by 9y to the fifth power. Okay, this is a tricky one, but let's do it together. We'll just have the square, the cube root of uh, 2x to the fourth power on top. We're not worried about rationalizing that. We just want to rationalize the denominator, so let's split it up into two different cube roots. Okay. And now I want to do something sort of clever. Okay, I want to do something sort of clever. I want to multiply by one again. But what I want is for that when I take this term in the denominator and I multiply it by this term here in this denominator, what should happen is that the cube root sign goes away. Okay. And if I want to get rid of a cube root, rather than multiplying by itself, which would give me the cube root of 9y to the fifth power squared, I want to write it, I want to put something in this denominator here such that when I do this multiplication, I would get the following. I want to have the cube root of 2x to the fourth power times something. And on the denominator, I want to have the cube root of 9y to the fifth power to the cube power 3 here, okay, to the power 3. All right, so it might be kind of tricky to type this out in the chat, um, but I will ask you guys, what do we think should go in this denominator here? And if you don't want to go to the bother of typing it out in the chat, you can unmute yourself and let me know what you think should go here. Okay, what should we put in this denominator such that when we multiply it out, we're going to get the cube root of 9y to the fifth power cubed? Yeah, Savannah's got it. We should take the cube root of 9y to the fifth power to the second power, such that when we multiply it all out, the total power will be three. Okay, so here's what I'm here's what I'm saying. We should write the cube root of 9y to the fifth power squared. Okay. Because on the first one we've got the cube root of 9y to the fifth power to the power 1. And if we would multiply two things with the same base but different powers, we would take those two powers, in our case 1 and 2, and we would add them to get 3. Okay, so that's what I want to multiply by there. So let's do that up top. It'll be the cube root of 9y to the fifth power squared. So we'll have 9y to the fifth power cube root squared. And then in the denominator, what's going to happen is we will have the cube root of something taken to the third power. That's going to be equal to, leave the top as it was, And the denominator is going to become just 9y to the fifth power. 
Now to simplify the top, I'm going to use one of our rules to take this cube root, and I'm going to take the square here, I'm going to take the square power here and move it inside. I'm going to take 9y to the fifth squared. Divided by 9y to the fifth. And now I'm going to combine these two cube roots. Using another one of our rules, we'll have just one big cube root sign. And on the inside, we will have 2x squared. I'm sorry, 2x to the fourth. And we'll multiply that by... 9y to the fifth to the powers 2 all over 9y to the fifth. Finally, we can expand that square there. We'll turn this into uh, what? It'll be the cube root of 2 times, well, 9 squared is 81, so 162x to the fourth. And y, what should the power on y be here? This power right here, what should we write? Twelve. Sorry, my handwriting is awful. This should be a power five here. <laughs> yeah, we should do ten. Yeah, I think I confused somebody by putting a power 5 that looked like a power 6, and you would multiply 6 times 2 and get 12, but we should do 5 times 2. Sorry about my handwriting. It should be 10. Okay, great. So that is fully, fully simplified. Okay, we've written the top as a single cube root. And we've written the denominator as a rational expression. So notice the denominator we started with contained a cube root. And then by the time we were done, the denominator didn't have any cube roots in it. OK, that's the game that we play. Just get rid of the roots in the denominator. OK, uh, are there any questions about this? example is a little bit lengthy. OK, seems like no questions, so we'll move on. Wow, my god, this handwriting is out of control. <laughs> using conjugates to rationalize denominator that's better okay so let's try the following. So this is based on the on the following principle. If we take one plus the square root of a and we multiply it times one minus the square root of a, what we would get here if we FOIL is one plus the square root of a minus the square root of a plus the square root of a squared and we can cancel these middle two terms plus square root of a and minus square root of a and we can simplify the final term and we would get just one plus a uh sorry there should be a minus sign we would get one minus a. OK, so this looks kind of like the process for foiling uh, or not foiling, but factoring a difference of squares. OK, except in this case, 
a isn't a perfect square, so we have to use the uh, notation square root of a. OK, so this is just to say that if our denominator looks something like 1 plus the square root of a, then we can multiply by 1 in a clever way. Namely, we'll take this right-hand side, this green thing, and divide it by itself. And that is going to give us a denominator which looks like 1 minus a. OK, so here's the process. If we want to rationalize, 1 divided by 1 plus the square root of a. We take 1 over 1 plus the square root of a and we multiply by 1. We'll multiply by 1 minus the square root of a divided by 1 minus the square root of a. And on the top, we're just going to get 1 times that thing, so 1 minus the square root of a. And on the bottom, we just said that if we take these two things and multiply them together, we get 1 minus a. OK, so that's how we rationalize the denominator using conjugates. OK, and conjugate is the word we give to the relationship between these two terms. Uh, let me use a different color. These blue terms here, 1 plus a is the conjugate of 1 minus the square root of a and vice versa. It's just a fancy math word we have for what we mean is one and then flip the sign of uh, either addition or subtraction and then the same thing on the end. Okay. So those are conjugates. All right, so let's see an example. Why, why don't we do minus this time? Okay. So if I want to rationalize this, I should just multiply by 1 in a clever way. And what should go in the denominator and the numerator should be the same. What should I put here in the numerator and denominator? I want it to be the conjugate of what's in the bottom. What should I, what should I write? Yes, we should use 3 plus the square root of 5. OK, we're just going to take this. We're going to take this sign here. And we're going to flip it. We're going to get 3 plus the square root of 5. And we're just going to rewrite that in the numerator so that we're multiplying by 1. The top multiplication is not too bad. 1 times something is just itself, right? Now let's see the bottom computation one more time. 3 minus the square root of 5. We'll multiply that times 3 plus the square root of 5. We would foil that out. The top remains the same. The bottom will become 9. Plus, if we do the outside, that's 3 square root 5. Inside will be minus 3 square root 5. And then L, the last one, will be plus, no, minus, sorry, minus square root of 5 squared. Stop. So the top stays the same. And the bottom, we can cancel out those two middle pieces which have square roots. And then all we're left off with is just 9 minus 25. Okay, so that's how we multiply by a conjugate. Okay, or sometimes we'll say take the conjugate, or we'll call this entire process conjugation, or something of, of that nature. All right, any questions about... Um, this stuff.
Why is it negative 25? Oh my God, thank you. Another mistake is why. It should be minus five. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Thank you for pointing that out, Savannah. Okay, so yeah, when we take a square root of five and we square it, we just get five. Okay, we get back whatever was underneath the square root. Okay, great. Well, at least I'm keeping you on your toes. Okay, so let's try some of these. Um, let's see. Why don't I... Why don't we try this one on our own? Take this first guy. Take this first guy here and let's try. Try on our own. Take one or maybe two minutes to try that one, okay? And if you finish that one, you can try the next two as well, just for practice. But focus on the first one for the time being. All right, let's see. Can I have people raise their hand if they need a little bit more time to try out number one on their own? Okay, one hand. So we'll wait a second and take another minute to try number one. Let's go ahead and talk over this first one together. OK, so we got to multiply a couple of things here. Let me rewrite it first. We've got 2x to the power 1 third, and we're multiplying that times 5x to the power 1 fourth. OK, so. Can anybody walk me through how we're going to try to complete this? What should we do here? If 
find a common denominator for the powers. Yeah, we're going to have to do that. Yeah, I think the first thing to, to maybe do here is to kind of rearrange it a little bit. Let's, we have four things being multiplied here. Two times x to the one third times five times x to the one fourth. We can do multiplication in any order that we want. So let's first rearrange and do the multiplication of the numbers first and then the multiplication of the x power second. OK, and we'll get here. The first thing will be 10. And then we'll have, let's just write x to the 1 3rd times x to the 1 4th as a single power of x. What should I do with the powers 1 3rd and 1 4th if I want to combine them into a single power here? Yeah, I think Abdul Rahman's got it. But what should I do here? Should I take those powers and add them, or should I multiply them? Yeah, we should add them. That's right. So in here, in this bubble, the first thing I'm just going to write is one third plus one fourth. And then I'm going to worry later about combining them into a single fraction. Well, to find a single fraction for one third plus one fourth, I should find a common denominator. The common denominator here is going to be 12. OK, that's going to be uh, 4 over 12 plus 3 over 12. Going to be equal to 10 times x to the power 7 over 12. OK. So that is how we simplify that one completely. OK. Uh, are there any questions about how we did that one? Or any comments? Is that a difficult problem or? Did you find that uh, on the easier side? You hear some feedback here. On the easier side, OK. Easier, sweet. All right, well, um, let's try some of these more complicated ones. Um, if you finished the other two, then you are doing great. Move that up there. I have a little bit more space to work on this one. OK, we're going to do these ones together. So let's try this first one first. We've got, what, 21x to the negative 2 thirds power divided by 7x to the 1 fifth power. Well, first of all, I can take a power of 7 out of the numerator and the denominator. OK, so I can take that 7 becomes a 1, and this 21 becomes a 3. Okay, so I can rewrite this whole thing as uh, 3x to the negative 2 thirds power divided by x to the 1 fifth power. And I've got a negative power in the numerator. That means I should move it to the denominator. Negative power means move to the denominator. So we'll keep 3 up top. We need to remember that the power here only goes with x. Okay, this negative two thirds power only applies to x, so we have to leave the three up top. And on the denominator, we'll have x to the power one fifth, and we'll multiply that times x to the power two thirds. And again, we have two different powers of x being multiplied together. We should add those powers. So we'll take three, we'll set, get x to the power one fifth plus two thirds which is 3 divided by x to the power, get a common denominator of 15. 3 over 15 plus 10 over 15 equals 3 
divided by x to the power 13 over 15. Okay. That's how I would uh, choose to write that one. Um, I mean, technically, uh, no, this is fine. Yeah, we're going to write it like this. I don't want to throw in too much confusion too fast. So that's 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 where I'd call it done for now. Let's try this second one here. Well, if I've got x to a power, to a power, I should take those powers and multiply them. So this should become x to the power 3 fifths times negative 1 over 6, which is x to the power negative 3 over 30, which is equal to x to the negative 1 over 10, which is equal to 1 over x to the power 1 over 10. Okay. Technically speaking, this is equal to 1 over the 10th root of x, because 1 over 10 power is the 10th root of x. And technically speaking, we should rationalize that denominator. If I have a 10th power root of x, I undo a 10th root by taking a 10th power. So I, in order to get a total of 10, I need to multiply this whole thing by the square, the tenth root of x to the ninth power on the top and bottom. And when I simplify that, the bottom will be the tenth root of x to the tenth power, and the top will be just uh, tenth root of x to the ninth power. And on the bottom, we'll have just x, I guess. Something like that. But you could probably stop here. That would be fine. I won't take off points if you stop there, unless I specifically ask to rationalize the denominator. OK, any questions about those second two problems? I'm curious, is there anybody out there who was able to complete both of those two problems correctly in the time that we had earlier? Could raise your hand, maybe. OK, seems like maybe not. <laughs> That's okay though. Um, those are some trickier problems, so we did them together today. All right, um, let's see, how much time do I have? I have about 17 minutes. I want to make sure I get to everything that I want to get to. I think I'm going to have time to do all of these examples. Let's try this next one. I'm going to switch the color up. X times x plus 1 to the negative 1 half power plus 2x to the x plus 1 to the 1 half power. OK, so we want to simplify this. All right. This one looks very tricky. Let's go through it slowly together. This is going to be equal to, we'll move that x plus 1 to the 1 half to the bottom. OK, so the first. Our goal here is going to be to probably rationalize this denominator on the left hand side, then find a common denominator on both sides. And then add across and get. 
uh, a single fraction. Okay, that's going to be our goal. So let's try it. First, rationalize the denominator. We'll get x times. Well, we would take this and we'd multiply by x plus 1 to the 1 half power. Okay, that's what we would do. And what would we get on the denom on the top? We'd get x times x plus 1 to the 1 half, and we divide by x plus 1. And then on the right hand side, we still got 2 times x plus 1 to the 1 half power. Something is a little bit fishy here. No, I think it's going to work out. All right, well, let's let's try it. Hopefully this works out. So what have we done so far? We've rationalized the denominator of the left hand rational expression. OK, so now we've got X plus one. That's nice and rational and kind of a round. Nice looking denominator. So we've kind of dealt with that first uh, initial problem. And now what we want to do is handle the second component of the problem, which is to combine these two expressions into one expression. OK, if I want to do that, what I should do is I should find a common denominator between these two things. The current denominator on the right hand rational expression is one. So what I want to do is I want to make this denominator on the right hand side look like X plus one. So what I should do is multiply this thing by one so I don't change its value. And I'm going to multiply by X plus one. Divided by X plus one. And let's just see what we get. We'll get x times x plus 1 to the 1 half plus 2 times x plus 1 times x plus 1 to the 1 half divided by x plus 1. Um, hmm. Did I copy down the problem right? One half times two times x to the one half. Yeah, I've copied it down, right? Something's fishy here. Something's very, very fishy here. I guess we could. Uh, take out a GCF on the top. Got a GCF of uh, x to the power, x plus 1 to the power 1 half. So let's take that out. We'll get x plus 1 to the power 1 half uh, times, on the inside we'll have x plus 2x plus 2. And on the, the bottom we'll have x plus 1. Aha, uh -huh. now I see how it's going to how it's going to work. No, I don't. X plus 2x plus 2. Should just be x plus 1 to the 1 half times 3x plus 2 divided by x plus 1. Is that really how we're how this is supposed to end? 
Okay, I guess that's really how this is supposed to end. It, it doesn't feel that satisfying since we couldn't cancel anything, but I suppose we've done really everything that we needed to do. Okay, so let's recap what happened. We started with two expressions and we were asked to simplify this, this addition problem, okay? The first thing that we recognized was that the expression on the left hand side had an irrational denominator. So our first order of business was to rationalize that denominator. OK, that took us up to here. And then what we wanted to do was combine the two expressions into one expression. So once we had found a rational denominator on the left hand side, we multiplied the right rational expression by one, hence not changing its value. But just to get a common denominator between these two expressions. OK, so we got our common denominator. And where did that take us? That took us up to here, up to this step. OK, and once we had that step, uh, we just had an addition of two things on the top. And our uh, common denominator on the bottom. Since I had an addition of two expressions which both contained a factor of x plus one to the one half, I took it out as a GCF. Okay, so these two, these two in blue here, came outside the expression, and what we were left with inside was just x plus 2 times x plus 1. So I expanded the 2x plus 1 to, to be uh, 2x plus 2. And then I add an x to it. And then I just simplified that down to 3x plus 2. And we left our blue GCF out front. And our common denominator just persisted throughout. I really thought that this was going in the direction of, of having some cancellation, so I thought I made an error, but I did not. Uh, this, is, this is how we were supposed to end up. OK, so it just goes to show you sometimes the answer isn't always as clean as you would like. Any questions about that? Jake was confused how to simplify the third. I think you're referring to uh, this step going here to there. Is that the one? Is Jake still here? OK, how to simplify the third one. OK, well, hang on. Let me let me finish the lecture and then maybe if you can stay after for a couple minutes, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, that previous problem that we did. OK. But I want to make sure I have time to get to adding and subtracting radicals, so let's talk about this really quickly. When we're adding and subtracting radicals, we can combine like terms. OK, and what I mean by like terms is 3 times the square root of a plus 4 times the square root of a is going to be equal to 7 times the square root of a. OK, so we just take these numbers out front and we add them together as long as they have the same square root here. OK, as long as they have the same square root. We call those a like term and we can combine them by adding the number out front. OK, this is kind of like doing, for example, 2x plus 3x. We get 5x. OK, this is kind of the, the basic principle of what's going on here. OK, so that is how we combine like terms. However, square root of a plus the square root of b is not 
equal to square root of a plus b. Okay, this is a really common mistake that pre-calculus students tend to make. I probably made it at some point during my career. If we take two square roots and we add them, we don't get just the addition of those square roots under the radical, okay? We can only add radicals using this process of finding like terms. Okay, so this is a big no, we don't do this. For the same reason that a plus b squared is not equal to a squared plus b squared, right? We have to FOIL, okay? If we were to take this square root of a plus b, we cannot just apply the square root to each of the sum ends. Okay. All right. So let's try some practice. The game here is we want to simplify the two expressions first. Simplify these first and then see if we have like terms. Okay, so the first one I'm going to simplify, square root 45, I can take, that's the square root of uh, 9 times 5 plus 7 times the square root of 4 times 5. 9 is a perfect square, so I'm going to take it out as a 3. And then 4 is a perfect square, I'm going to take it out as a 2, so I'll have 7 times 2 times the square root of 5. This will be equal to 3 square root 5 plus 14 square root 5. And now I have like terms. Each of these have a square root 5. It's the same number under the square root, so I can combine them by adding the coefficients to get 17 times the square root of 5. OK, Are there any questions about how I. How I added these radicals. OK, so. Just a reminder of what we did today, adding and subtracting radicals, we got to simplify first, then combine like terms. Uh, when we have a, an irrational denominator that is of the form one plus the square root of a or some number minus the square root of a, we need to use conjugates to rationalize it. We learned all about how to rationalize a denominator in the more simple case when we just have uh, a monomial in the denominator. We learned about simplifying radicals in the case of square roots and nth roots. And we learned all these properties of radicals here at the top, the most important of which were three and four. Okay. So that's what we've done today. Um, that's where we're gonna call it for the day, if you have additional questions, you can stay after class for a few minutes and we can talk things over. Um, yes, Jake, uh, you only add the radicals once you find the like terms. That's exactly right. We can't add them in their original state because it's they're incompatible. OK, so we have to simplify first and then look for compatible terms. OK, well, that's all for today. If you have uh, any further questions, then you can stay after class. Uh, otherwise, have a great day. And I'm going to switch to my headphones.
All right, Jake, are you still here? Do you want to see something? You wanted to see how we simplify one of these guys up here. OK. Um, is it this green one here in the red box that you wanted to see? Yes, OK, great. So let me find some space. What's it? X to the three fifths to the negative one sixth. OK. So what we learned in a previous lecture was if we take x to some power a, uh, sorry, I should put this parentheses on the outside, take x to the power a, we take that to the power b, what should we do with those powers? To simplify. Yeah, multiply, right? We get x to the power a times b. Okay. So in our case, our a and b are 3 fifths and negative 1 sixth. So we're going to multiply those powers. So we take x and the power will be 3 fifths times negative 1 sixth. Okay, with me so far? Okay, so if we multiply fractions, we just multiply straight across. So 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. And 5 times 6 is 30. Now, this fraction here can be simplified. 3 goes into 30 and negative 3. It goes into negative 3 one time, uh, negative 1 times, I guess. And it goes into 30 10 times. So that's how I got negative 1 10. Still good? OK. And then we had another rule which said that if I have x to the power negative a, if I have a negative power, that's the same as 1 divided by x to that power, but as a positive number. OK, this was a rule, another rule that we learned on the exponents day. So I'm going to rewrite that as 1 divided by x to the power 1 tenth. OK. So and that's it. Um, I talked a little bit after that about. Potentially rationalizing this denominator. Um, but it's not. in my opinion, totally necessary, but do you want to see that explanation as well? Does the answer always end positive? Um, yes, so, well, yes and no. If I'll say what a better thing to say would be that after we completely simplify an expression like this, the powers should be positive powers. OK, that doesn't mean that we might not have a negative yeah, sign. That, for example, if we were to do like, uh, um, I don't know, negative women, 3 so good to, to the power negative 7. This would be equal to uh, we can't 1 easy. over negative 3 My domain. to the power 7. Yep. OK, so it's possible for us to have a negative number. It's just not possible for us to have a negative power. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, any other questions about that? Okay. No. No questions. Okay. Um, well, uh, Alex, did you have any questions at all? <laughs> I was just staying and seeing what they're asking. Okay. No Thank problem. you. Yeah, have a good one.